Buenos días. Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank to thank Katarina Miller, the European Women Lawyers Association, and all the other co-organizers for bringing this congress to Madrid. It's really a great opportunity being for two days the focus of reflection about the, the fourth industrial revolution and ethics with so many unimportant experts. It's an honor for me, it's a pleasure to, introdu to introduce Gina Ripon. She is a genuine authority in her academic field. She is professor of cognitive neuroimaging and the Aston Brain Center of the Aston University in Birmingham, UK. In the University of Aston, she has been, among other responsibilities, Deputy Head of a School of the Life and Health Science, Head of Psychology, Psychology Group, and Deputy Director of Neurosciences Research Institute. Previously, she was Honorary Research Fellow in the Imperial College School of Medicine in London, lecture in psychology in the University of Warwick, and she has been visiting research fellow in different universities outside the UK, as well as a speaker, a speaker in conferences around the world. Her research interest involves the application of brain, brain imaging techniques. Her findings has been applied to the study of autistic spectrum disorders and to dyslexia. She also ha has explored class classic cognitive neuroscience problems in, for example, linguistic processing, learning and memory, and affect cognition interactions. She is also very well known for her recent book, The Gendered Brain. In her book, she maintains that male and female brains are not so different, providing with her findings a new paradigm. The book shows how we first arrive at the conviction that the female brain is different and thus inferior. How this misperception persists into the 21st century and how the latest findings in neuroscience can and should dispel such fallacies forever. As Rachel Cook, a journalist of The Guardian, said about her book, it has the power to do vastly more for gender equality than any number of feminist manifestos. Welcome, gracias, bienvenida a tu Madrid. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, I also would like to thank Katerina and the organizers for inviting me. Um, I'm very honored to be invited to attend this particular meeting with this amazing organization. Um, and I'm very awed <laughs> to be in the presence of people who are actually out in the real world doing things. I've 
as has been described, I've spent all my life in academics, um, in a brain imaging laboratory, um, studying the brain. Um, and the book, The Gendered Brain, um, or Gender and Our Brains in America, as it's called differently, um, was really the result of looking at the outside world and saying, what can all the research that I've done on the brain really contribute to, to progress rather than just um, publish learned papers in articles. So it's great for me to be here with so many people who might be able to put some of my frustrations um, into action and see if we can you know, change the world together. So without further ado, I'm gonna to talk to you about um, gender gaps because it is a book about brains but it's also very much a book about gender gaps, where they come from um, and what they mean. And it's very much of looking at the agenda, the research agenda associated with understanding whether or not there are differences between male and female brains. And the fact that there has for a very long time been what I call a blame the brain agenda, that people look at gender gaps and say, yes, it's shocking that there are gaps like that in society, but don't forget that some of the people who are uh, in the minority perhaps are there because of um, a lack of basic ability, etc. So it's really challenging that idea, seeing where it comes from, and trying to understand how really studying the brain could tell us something useful for, or could tell people like you something useful who are going to um, be trying to put in place initiatives to overcome these gender gaps. So as was mentioned, um, I am a, a, a cognitive neuroscientist or a brain imager in, in popular terms. Um, and this is a um, indication of the kind of work that I do. Uh, I work at the Aston Brain Center. We have a whole range of state-of-the-art brain imaging techniques. Um, you can see uh, in the top left-hand corner, a very old picture obviously of me with a then very young daughter discovering the problems of having a mother as a neuroscientist, um, but she seems to have survived. Um, I study, uh, at the moment I'm studying developmental differences, particularly um, autism, children on the autism spectrum. So I'm really interested in how brains get to be different. There is a, a saying in the autism community that if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. So what I really wanted to know is how brains get to be different are there differences between different people? Um, what do those brain differences mean for the owners of those brains? Um, and how might that translate into the kind of um, behavior differences we look at in developmental disorders, but also in the wider community? Is it generally, genuinely the case that people have different brains which give them different skills? So my other hat um, is very much to do, in fact, with gender gaps, um, and having listened to some of the very in, in, informative and, and, and highly informed talks already this morning, I know that you're already aware of the kind of gender gaps um, that are really significant for us to address. Um, and it's very much in terms of looking at male-female differences, and the principles I'm going to talk about are about the fact, looking at the way in which women are underrepresented in key areas. But the principles, the ideas about how people get to be unrepresented, um, what that might mean, where this came from, and, and what we uh, and society needs to do about it, um, can apply to any groups. So, one of the areas I look at a lot is the underrepresentation of women in science. And clearly, this is also an issue which is a major theme in this conference because it has huge significance for us in the future. I'm just going to walk across and point to things. So um, looking at uh, this are UK figures, looking at the representation of women in science, only 10% of our students um, in 2017 did computing A-level, higher exams. Um, looking at the core science subjects, um, is something which is going to... Do I need to keep moving it? Or? No? Okay. Uh, if there's any help back there. Um, effectively, what I'm talking about, then, is to say that the um, girls seem to choose not to do science. And you could say, well, does that matter? They could choose to do something else. And I think what we've already addressed today is the future really is science. And I know as a scientist I might say that, but I think it has a huge significance... Um, for us, particularly with response to artificial intelligence. And one of the graphs I've got there, if we can get it back. 
is, um, is looking at the involvement of, uh, of women in artificial intelligence. There was a, um, a study done every year by the World Economic Forum looking at the global uh, gender gap interest, uh, um, the global gender gap. And what it's actually saying this year, it looked at artificial intelligence. Sorry, I need to go back. Okay, and just to say, I don't know if you can see these figures, but if you look at the distribution of males and females in our, the artificial intelligence workforce, and these were data collected from LinkedIn and various other um, self-declared skills that people had, you can see the green figures are there's, in all of these various industries, there is the involvement of males and females uh, in artificial intelligence, and it's pretty clear that the involvement of women is very much in the minority. And there's, these figures are actually worse than they look, because if you look at the kind of skill, artificial intelligence skills that women have, they are very much at the lower level. So we are looking at the emergence of another gender gap, but it's a gender gap which is going to have huge significance for everybody, because artificial intelligence, I really believe, is going to affect the way in which society is developing, and it's clear that this is a theme which is informing our own conf conference. So you might say, so where is the brain in all of this? Why is she talking about these kind of statistics when she's actually a brain scientist? But that's because I've been trying to, for some time, and that's the origin of the book, to unpack this particular belief in the world about brains, male and female brains. The idea that we have two types of body, whatever it is, and bearing in mind we're looking way back to the 18th century, whatever it is that determined the differences between male and female anatomy, also determined what kind of brain you had. So there was a very clear belief that if you had a female anatomy, you had a female brain. If you had a female brain, that brought with it a, a particular portfolio of skills. So you would be very good at empathy and understanding emotion, but you'd be the pretty rubbish at reading maps or anything scientific. If you had a male brain, you were fantastic at these kind of spatial skills, um, but you were rubbish at reading maps, and um, therefore you were not able to, um, uh, you know, uh, you, sorry, I'm going to start again, because <laughs> this is kind of putting me off. <laughs> um, so what, what it really meant was that you had a particular portfolio of skills, and that that portfolio of skills meant that you had a different role to play in society. So what we're looking at here is, is the empathic type um, individuals. No, I don't, I don't want that yet, thank you. <laughs> so is there a way I can stop that happening? <laughs> no, 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 okay. Right. <laughs> I'll go back to where I was. <laughs> You're taking me right through to the end. Okay. So we're looking at gender gaps, and we're saying that... Um, because you've got a different brain, you have a different place in society. And this is a kind of contemporary representation of what's going on, but really this is a representation of what was happening in the 18th century. When scientists first started looking, they looked at gender gaps and they said, women have got an inferior place in society, so that must be because, because they've got inferior brains. And there is a, a long history of the way in which um, women's brains have always been deemed inferior, um, started to get a bit more polite in the 19th century, and they talked about women's brains being complementary. So their brains allowed them to be womanly, com womanly companions of man, etc. So it is, a, it is a belief, a blame, bra blame the brain campaign, which has a long history. And the origin of that was that... Um, we then had this idea that biology was destiny. And this is important to understand for anybody who's trying to address a gender gap. If there is a belief that this gender gap arrives from some kind of natural, naturally determined difference, then there's another kind of narrative, not always unspoken, which says we shouldn't mess around with that. You know, people have the brains they're born with, that gives them particular skills, particular places in society, and we should live with that. Um, and that particular belief goes way back, um, as we will see a bit later, even to Charles Darwin, who felt that women were inferior, they were lower down the evolutionary tree, um, and trying to change that in any way was actually going to derail the progress of evolution. So what kind of belief did we have there? Well, ideally, it would say that, first of all, you've got two different types of brain. So you've got the male brain, which arrives in the world, perhaps with some of the skills it might already need to become 
you know, a Nobel Prize winner or a leader of, leader of men or a prime minister or president. Um, and that brain, brain grew bigger and acquired certain skills and eventually arrived at an, at a, you know, an end point, a fixed end point, the male brain, which meant that you had all the necessary skills to be a high achiever. Whereas the female brain, um, slightly smaller, might come back to that, I cheekily colored it pink. Um, female brain arrived without the necessary skills, um, got a bit bigger, um, wasn't exposed to the dangers of higher education um, because uh, that might affect her reproductive system. And there was a genuine belief in the 19th century that you shouldn't educate women because they would be less able to produce children, which was, of course, their role in life. Um, so eventually, again, you get a brain which arrives at a fixed end point, which is perhaps very good at emotion, um, perhaps overall emotion, but likes being pink and princessy, etc. So the idea is that there is two types of brains, a male brain and a female brain. And the underlying argument was that the female brain was actually, um, if perhaps not inferior, but suited for different, different roles in society, different successes in the world. So I really wanted to challenge that. I thought, you know, apart from being hopefully a, 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 a well-paid-up feminist, I felt this didn't really seem to reflect the um, experiences I had had, the imaging I was doing, looking at differences in the brain, spending a long time, actually, myself, trying to find brain differences, thinking I must be doing something wrong because I couldn't find any differences between males and female brains. So I thought, I need to go back, review the research and say, what, what really is the true story behind this? And this is where I come to what I call the uh, sex differences in the brain, the iceberg problem. Once, bearing in mind that all the theories about female and male brains had arrived before we had any proper way of looking at the brain. We looked at uh, dead brains, we looked at damaged brains or diseased brains, but we didn't have any way of looking at the intact human brain in a living individual carrying out a particular task, which is the kind of work that I do. And so it then became clear that once brain imaging arrived, maybe this would be a, a great time for a blank slate. Let's just have a look at brains. Let's not pursue the hunt the differences agenda. Let's just find out how brains worked, what they were for. But unfortunately, that kind of political thread actually still carried through into science. And a lot of the early work was still saying, male brains must be different from female brains. Let's try out our te technology to see how best to actually prove that that was the case. So what we get in research, if you look at it, and the, and the book, for those of you who've, who've seen it, um, a lot of it is actually saying, so are there any sex differences in the brain? And people look at you really surprised and say, well, of course there are. But actually, if you look at the data very carefully, that tells a different story. And what I call is the iceberg problem is, first of all, people who want to know about the male and female brain will look at published research. And they'll say, well, there's lots and lots of papers which prove that there are sex differences in the adult human brain. And it's very often the case that this is, um, uh, you know, these are in the titles of journal articles. So people looking at journalists, for example, wanting to find out where these differences were, will actually do a quick search. Oh, look, here's a paper which talks about sex differences. Might then count them up and say... Um, can we move this again? <laughs> we might then count them up and say, um, uh, you know, where are these sex differences? Here's lots and lots of papers which are publishing sex differences. But then if you look more carefully, which journalists might not, you might then say, okay, um, if we looked at another set of papers, one set of papers reports a, a difference in the amygdala part of the brain or the hippocampus, and another part of the, um, another paper will come out a couple of months' time. Yes, we found differences but actually they're in a different part of the brain, and the brain you, the difference you found two months ago, we didn't find in our set of studies. And the key thing is that uh, what you're really looking at is people finding lots and lots of differences, but never necessarily the same. So you get the impression that there's lots of differences and people will just add them up. But if you look very carefully, you'll find that, so which is it? Okay. Nope. <laughs> Sorry, is it? Is it possible to go back to the slide where it left? <laughs> um, okay. Right, okay. <laughs> 
sorry, <laughs> bear with me. Um, the idea is that it looks as though there are lots of differences. And the other thing that happens is that you get scientists themselves being a bit um, over-enthusiastic in how they report differences. We need to remember that when we're talking about differences, we're not talking about absolute differences. Male brains are like this, female brains are like that. The kind of differences we're looking at are shown in those overlapping data curves there. The differences between males and females are tiny, both in terms of their brains and their behavior. And I think that's really important to remember and something that we shouldn't lose sight of because we assume that we're talking about absolute differences, they're very tiny. And for me, as an autism researcher, what's more interesting is the differences within the groups. The differences within groups of men and within groups of female are much bigger than any differences between them. The other thing we need to bear in mind is that um, favorite book of mine, very much attacked. Um, when, brain imaging, when brain images emerged, there was a wave of what I uh, cheekily call neurotrash. Um, which is where self-help gurus, etc., decided that these wonderful images were going to be great to sell their books. And you'll find lots and lots of these kind of books which um, misrepresent, um, not necessarily, and I'm sure it's not deliberately, they misrepresent what's shown by brain imaging, they misunderstand what's shown, but they use it to prove that Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. And very much in the popular press, I don't know if it's the same in Europe and other countries, if there's a scientific paper which reports the difference between males and female brains, we've already said they may be in different parts, but they don't worry about details like that, it's always at last the truth. And so there's some hidden reality out there that scientists really need to understand. So at last the truth, men's brains are different from women's brains. The other thing we don't see is, of course, we tend only to publish those papers where a difference is found. What we don't publish are those papers where a difference isn't found. And actually, it's quite clear by a very careful scrutiny of what's going on and, and estimating, modeling how many uh, different papers it might take to produce a difference or different studies, is that there are a large number of studies that didn't find any differences. And you think, actually, that's really quite important because if we're assuming that there is a major difference between male and female brains, we really need to know where people didn't find differences. And the same thing is actually true of this link between your brain um, and your behavior, because psychologists joined in on the hunt the difference agenda and produced this nice list of um, differences between male and female skills, behaviors, etc. And then in, uh, people like Janet Hyde, for example, um, and a whole range of different theorists said, well, let's actually have a look at the whole of these studies. Let's have a look at how big these differences are. Let's have a look at where, if you look at the tables in the paper, it's clear that there aren't differences, but the authors don't concentrate on those. And they find when they put all of those data together, that actually it's clear that men and women are much more similar than they are different. So when people are trying to set up different agendas and say we must understand that men, you know, men have different portfolios of skills, or even, I have to confess, where women say women have a unique set of skills that we could bring to the boardroom, I'm afraid the data doesn't necessarily support that argument, which, as you could probably understand, doesn't make me that popular when I make that kind of comment. But I think the key thing is, I really believe that everybody's different from everybody else. Um, every brain is different from every other brain, and we really need to understand where those differences come from. And I will be getting there. So the question, female brains are different from male brains, this is a take-home message for you if you kind of uh, are out in the outside world setting up diversity initiatives, for example, and people say, well, I'm afraid you'll find that male brains are like this and female brains are like that, then quick answer uh, is this is all neurotrash. Um, or as somebody told me uh, uh, last night, um, uh, apologies to the uh, interpreters, so this is neuro bullshit. Um, so that's another answer you can give them. So moving on. Okay. So we think there is really no clear difference in male and female structures in the brains or behavior. But we do in science, and I think this is possibly relevant again to the areas you're working in, we have what's called the gender equality paradox. The idea is that 
if male and female brains are the same, or they have the same skills, then in fact there shouldn't be any gender gaps. There should actually be a clear representation of all the various skills that people have in whatever area you're interested in. Well, in science, most recently, there is uh, a discussion of something called the gender equality paradox. The idea that in those countries, Scandinavian countries and Iceland, um, where the gender gap in the overall measures of gender gap is smallest, the underrepresentation of women in science is still very large, and in some cases much larger than in other countries where there is a, a gender equality gap. Uh, uh, and therefore, they're saying an um, interesting discussion of why, if you look at the skills of the girls concerned, they clearly have the skills, but they're choosing not to go into science. And the differences emerge from a seemingly, very patronizing, I thought, seemingly rational choice to pursue academic paths that are a personal strength. And they're saying these girls are equally good at science and arts and humanities. For some reason, they're not choosing to do science, they're going off to do, and I put in inverted commas, painting and drawing. Um, so you can get a kind of underlying narrative that individuals are saying, so we set up all these diversity initiatives, we try and encourage girls into science. They, they seem to be pretty good at it, uh, but they choose not to do it. So what is going on here? And this is really where my brain imaging and my kind of feminist underrepresentation of women in science worlds came together. I felt that we really needed to understand what it is like to be a scientist not just to have the cognitive skills which would make you a good scientist, but also to say, what is the culture that I might experience if I want to go into science? I felt it is important, and certainly in terms of the other work that I've been doing, I really believe that it, in order to understand this apparent paradox to solve this conundrum, or to be aware of it in terms of any future diversity initiatives, we need to look outside the head as much as we do inside the head. And this is not a replay of the nature versus nurture argument. It's a new way of thinking about the fact that our brains are so changeable and responsive to the outside world that the two, nature versus nurture, is entangled. We can't think of them as separate. So we really need to understand what are our brains for, and if we understand that properly, we could then say, well, if our brains function in a particular world, and the world offers different things to different people, that may be the basis of some of the gender gaps that we're trying to understand. So from here, this, uh, you'll be pleased to hear, I'm not going to go through this neuroanatomy in detail, I want to draw attention to the fact that cognitive neuroscientists like myself have always focused on um, the evolutionary youngest part of the brain, the part of the brain which is, is proportionally largest in humans, and said so this is what gives us these amazing cognitive skills. We, can, uh, different, we develop language, we can be creative, we can be scientists, we can um, solve problems, we're information, cool information processes, and that's hence the picture of um, Sherlock Holmes there. Okay. But what we now know is, and this is the area that I then moved into, is that our brains, human brains, are made, uh, uh, evolved to make us social. So the human race has survived because we are collaborative. We have the largest number of social networks of any other species, um, and the biggest uh, social networks of other species, um, and we have a very clearly developed set of social skills. We have a clear sense of self, who we are, we understand other people, a sort of theory of mind. We understand what other people might be thinking, what they might be bringing to a conversation or a situation. We have a sense of belonging, a very powerful sense of belonging, and I'll come to that. We really feel the need to belong, to identify and belong to certain in-groups, to understand the rules of those in-groups, how they behave. And we want to be accepted by those in-groups. We don't want them to reject us. We want to work out how we should fit in, and fitting in is very powerful. And we look at the world, and we understand that there are different beliefs about different types of people. So our brains are actually responding all the time to stereotypes, because our brains are in the outside world trying to understand the rules of belonging. And if the world is full of stereotypes, which says, if you're a man, you're like this, or if you're a woman, you're like this, um, and that uh, any, any other kind of grouping that we might come across, it's clear that the human race is very keen to um, understand those sort of rules. But we're also driven, 
Um, although we like to think we've evolved to be superior, we're still driven by our little Pixar figures, our emotions. So we want to experience positive, uh, uh, positive feedback from whatever it is we're doing in the outside world. Maybe it's solving a problem, but maybe it's also being part of a social network. And we also have a system in the brain, and this is where all my research is based, it's a picture of traffic lights or, or railway points. We have a system which is called the go-no-go -no -go system, um, or which I call the inner limiter. We have a kind of speed control system in our brains, which actually links those two together. It says, as your, your brain is going to drive you through the world, it's going to make you avoid situations which give you negative feedback, or the kind of mistakes where you... you, you fail to solve a problem, or it's going to uh, drive you towards situations where you feel you're accepted, you belong to the right kind of network, etc. So it's really to say um, that we need to understand that the brain is always responding to the outside world, and it will change the processes. And I'll show you this, not, um, uh, not in too much detail, because I think that we're running out of time, possibly. We need to understand that our brains solve problems, not just as problems, they also monitor the context in which those problems are presented. And there's a social process called stereotype threat, where if you're a member of a particular group, which has a reputation for not being good at some particular skill, um, and you're in a situation where that skill is being tested, um, and it's drawn to your attention the fact that you, know, you, don't have, um, you, you, you belong to a particular group who struggles with this, this will change your behavior. And what we now know, it will also change your brain. So here we have three groups of women who were given a spatial task, a, sign, a, a mental rotation task. One group was told, this is a task that women struggle with, but actually, um, not to worry, I'm going to put you in my scanner. I want to see what happens to your brain when you solve this problem. Another group, just given neutral instructions. Third group, positive. This is a task which women are actually very good at, sort of perspective-taking task. So I want to see what happens to your brain when you're solving that problem. And what you find is that the women who have the negative message make the most mistakes, but their brains also respond differently. The part of the brain, the little traffic light system I showed you, um, actually is much more active. So the brain is kind of monitoring, oh, you know, you've got an error evaluate, you're part of a group which doesn't do very well on this, do you want to do well, or um, you're worried that you're going to make more mistakes, etc. Whereas the women who had the positive message, the areas of the brain which were activated were the appropriate areas, the areas of the brain which solve visuospatial tasks, which is what the task was. So not only is your brain an amazing information processing system, it is also sensitive to the context in which those problems are presented. And I think that's important to remember because it tells us a lot more about how the brain is really embedded in the world and how the brain will affect the world. And these are the kind of studies I've been doing, some of them in my lab, which is to look at the effect of uh, negative social events on self-esteem. And this is how good you feel about yourself. There's various ways of measuring it. And the kind of task we use is very simple social rejection task, playing a video game which has two little people throwing a ball to each other, then your little avatar pops up and they throw the ball to you and you're having a great time. Um, and then all of a sudden they stop throwing the ball to you and they just throw it to each other. And I've actually done this task. And you think, I know this is a video game, but I really think they should include me as well. Um, and your self-esteem starts to drop, and the part of the brain which is activated is your traffic light system. So effectively, it's saying this is, this is a task where you're not welcome, you're rejected, etc. And all of these other kind of tasks are all associated with that, looking at the effect on, um, on your self-esteem of being in a social situation where uh, you're rejected or where you make a mistake and you're very critical of yourself. And what's interesting in terms of how powerful this is in terms of driving our behavior, that the parts of the brain which are activated when we experience a drop in self-esteem, however it is uh, engineered, are exactly the same parts of the brain which are activated by real pain. So the message here is that being social belonging is a very important brain driver. And our brain will do all it can to avoid situations where we suffer some kind of loss of self-esteem. Now, hopefully you're still with me in terms of, of the story I'm trying to unfold. The other side of the story is that a loss of self-esteem has 
a very powerful effect in all sorts of aspects of behavior, and I won't go into these in detail, but any loss of self-esteem is associated with poor self-image, people thinking I don't really feel good about myself, high rejection sensitivity, oh, I don't want to approach a situation like that because I don't think they'll welcome me, high levels of self-criticism, oh, you know, I you know, screwed it up again, my fault. Um, and sometimes a, a process called self-silencing where individuals just withdraw from the situation. Very classic in, in academics. And in fact, one of the biggest studies was done in looking at women in, in, in high-functioning law firms where they went in thinking, you know, I don't really belong here. Um, they made a little mistake and gradually they withdraw and drop out. And of course, understanding why people drop out is a key understanding of, of gender gaps. So what I was really interested in, um, and I think this is just an illustration, and we've seen some discussion about this already, is how this might understand, help us understand why women choose not to go into science, or why when they're in science, they drop out. On the left-hand side, we have one of the greatest scientists of all time, Charles Darwin, who had very clear views about the difference between men and women. Uh, the chief distinction in the intellectual powers of the two sexes is shown by man attaining to a high eminence in whatever he takes up than women can attain. And you think, okay, 150, nearly 200 years ago, we've moved on. But this rogues gallery on the right are all uh, male scientists commenting on their feelings that women shouldn't be involved in science. So we had Larry Summers, the then president of Harvard, explaining the lack of high achieving mathematicians and engineers among women by saying there was a different availability of aptitude at the high end. Uh, we have James Damore, who wrote the notorious Google memo, saying effectively Google was wasting its time with diversity initiatives because um, the distribution of preferences and abilities of men and women differ in part, very kindly, uh, due to biological causes. And then last year before last, now Alessandra Strumia, a physicist at CERN, stood up and said that physics shouldn't be wasting its time on educating women into physics because effectively they weren't capable um, and physics would do better in focusing on those with the right kind of skills, i.e. men. So you could say, well, this is a particular culture where if you were very skilled, you might look at that, that culture and think, is this the kind of culture that would, rec would, that would welcome me? And there are more issues of this, which I won't go into detail given the time, but we've already had a sort of glimpse of some of them. The idea that if you look at science, bearing in mind that our brain is susceptible not only to the experiences we have or don't have, but also to the attitude and expectations in the culture in which we're trying to function. So if in science you have a belief that looking at expectations of brilliance, looking at different disciplines within science, finding that there's a very powerful link between the belief that um, genius, at high levels of achievement, winning Nobel Prizes is some kind of innate factor, and in fact an innate factor which is uniquely um, uh, donated to men. So it's much more likely that the people who do well will be born to do well, and it's much more likely that they will be born to be men. They do occasionally make um, distinctions for people like Marie Curie, uh, but she did have to win two Nobel Prizes in order to be made an exception. And the idea also, we've already heard about Hedy Lamarr. Uh, it's very interesting that she actually developed, with a male engineer, a particular technique during the war to scramble enemies' messages. Um, and if you look at how her, work, her contribution is described, it's much more in terms of she worked really, really hard. Wasn't it lucky that she was paired with this uh, male engineer? And her kind of contribution is described in terms of of seeds, you know, being very carefully nurtured over time, working with other people, where his contribution to exactly the same process is described in terms of the light bulb, the kind of genius moment uh, that only a man could have. So even if women get into science, their achievements are differently recognized. And this is also true of what's called the Matilda effect, where if you look at who gets um, attributed the praise, even if it's a team paper, um, 
It's much more likely that the lead author or the principal author will be male. There may be females in there as well. And this is also echoed in lots of studies looking at who gets um, funding, um, the number of papers which are generated by males and females, etc. So even if you get over the idea that you know, you're really not welcome in this, in this culture, if you get into the culture, any success you have is differently uh, acknowledged. So I think just closing here, my take home message is that um, brains reflect the lives they've lived. And I think that's a kind of another part of the story, which is the experiences you have, even if it's things like the kind of toys you play with, will change your brain in a very particular way. But what I've been focusing on really is that a gendered world produces a gendered brain. And having gone through lots and lots of complicated brain images, I found this really nice picture by a six-year-old, which actually, I think, sums it all up, that we need to understand that our brains are attached to the world, but more particularly that that world will change our brains. So finally, it's just to say that there are two parts of this argument. There's the gendered brain, which I've been looking at, which is really trying to unpack the blame the brain culture. But it's also saying that it's no point saying if we're kind of trying to close gender gaps, we need just to upskill the people who are lower down in the workforce. That is certainly a case, but we need also to understand, and looking at, for example, the, the, uh, the global gender gap report, I think it's a nice image on the cover, which shows that that culture is different for different people. And no matter how hard you try to upskill them, they will experience the world differently and the world will change their brains. So my closing message to you all, and good luck, is um, mind the gap. Okay, thank you. Thank you.